about the two main kinds of rat milk. Well, hello, hello, welcome. Come on in. Great to see you guys. Great to see you. One before we get started, um, as people file in, I wanted to make you aware that. Uh, well, first of all, so this is a live uh, question and answer. Um, you um, you post your your questions in the chat. And my uh, assistant, Daryl, will post the questions and I will answer them. And if it's something that's beyond the scope of what I do for a living, um, I won't be able to answer it. And it doesn't always have to be something uh, medical. You could ask me something personal, as long as it's not too personal. All right, but before we get started also, um, I just wanted to make you aware of something that I saw yesterday that was exciting to me. It's new news in the psychedelic world um, that a company that has been testing a derivative of LSD for anxiety has been granted breakthrough um, status from the FDA to move forward and move forward faster. That's what uh, FDA, or that's what breakthrough designation means. Um, and this drug, uh, in their first couple of uh, stages or phases of their trial, um, one dose treated generalized anxiety disorder um, for up to 12 weeks so far. They're still doing clinical trials. So that's exciting to me. Generalized anxiety disorder is is not easy to treat. Um, and the thought of treat, and, and most times people have to just manage their symptoms um, you know, reduce as opposed to go away completely. So I'll be interested to see just how effective, like do the symptoms go away completely? That would be something um, outstanding, but we'll see. Um, so I will, th that's one of the things that I announced in my, uh, or I, I made people aware of um, in my weekly newsletter. I like to keep people up to date on things that I hear about. If you want to uh, stay in touch with me or stay connected and also hear about things like that, um, you can sign up for my email list at getmentalhealthtips.com. That's getmentalhealthtips.com. It's on the screen there for you. And uh, there's no, it's free. It's just me sending out information each week. All right, so let's, and, I'll, and I also plan to have uh, an upcoming video explaining more details about um, the, uh, the, the new medication and, and what the next steps for that will be. All righty, let's get going. All right, Pama, thanks for your question. Do you know cases of people successfully overcoming gambling addiction and how they do it? So, no, I don't know anyone, or I don't, actually, I do. Um, no, sorry. So, I don't know, have know any cases from, like, experience of people who've overcome. I've known people who have been in treatment for it. And just like with any of the other addictions, particularly like substance abuse, or substance addiction, um, people go into remission and there's still a risk of relapse. That's how it is with addiction. Most uh, addictions, if you go to like an AA meeting or something, um, you'll introduce yourself as still an addict with the vulnerability to have a relapse at some point. Um, I would think that gambling addiction would be a similar, uh, similar setup where you can go into remission and stay in remission, but it's still a vulnerability that uh, something could trigger you to get started again and then have the trouble and have a problem again and relapse and then have to kind of get back out of it. Um, as far as the, the treatment goes, 
um, it's a behavioral based, behaviorally based treatment approach and the actual steps to that and, and what they actually do, I don't know because I don't do that kind of treatment for um, behavioral addictions. I don't do addiction treatment, period, but behavioral addictions. Thanks for that question. All right, Maj, when do we know that we have anxiety disorder or not just stress? Very good question. So an anxiety disorder versus just anxiety, because keep in mind, anxiety is also a response to, so we can all have anxiety. Um, but when it, when it becomes a disorder is when you have persistent anxiety symptoms that interfere with your daily functioning in some way or your productivity in some way, and it's not always triggered. So stress, um, let's say you've got uh, a lot of, uh, you've got financial uh, strain, um, you're out of work or something, you've got all these things going on that make you feel um, tense and anxious because you're worrying about how you're going to get through these things. Um, maybe you're having trouble sleeping. And that can go on for a while as long as the stressor is still pressing on you, you know, as long as it's still an issue. But that is more situational anxiety that's not necessarily a disorder because once the situation passes, presumably, if you don't have a disorder, your anxiety symptoms also pass um, versus the person who has an anxiety disorder doesn't need um, a stressor to have similar symptoms. So um, something stressful going on can make their symptoms worse or aggravate their baseline anxiety disorder. But even in the absence of a stress, they could be on vacation and still wake up with chest pain or wake up feeling nauseous um, or struggle with nausea all day uh, for various reasons. So and, and not always be aware of why they're feeling that way. So that's kind of one way to make the distinction between symptoms that come because you're under stress versus anxiety related or anxiety type symptoms that come with no stressor, worse when there's a stressor, but still present when there's none. All right. Oh boy. Um, oh, I see you in watch 79. Thanks for your question. <laughs> I'm addicted to Dr. Tracy Mark's videos. Is that healthy? Um, that's a good one. I like that. Uh, I'd like to think it's healthy. I, I'm, um, yeah, keep watching. Thank you for that. JW, is Adderall a medication that is to be taken as needed or every day? Thanks for that question. So, um, so the need for, for a stimulant. Okay, so Adderall is a stimulant that we use to treat ADHD attention deficit hyperactivity disorder. That's the main reason we use Adderall. It's kind of used sometimes in other contexts as well. Um, the problem of ADHD is a daily problem. It's not just something that comes and goes, uh, you know, that, that pops up and then kind of goes away. However, for some people, it can be more problematic under certain circumstances and not as problematic uh, at other times. For that kind of person, um, that person may do better only taking the stimulant under certain circumstances. So let me tell, let's just give you an example. So let's say um, with your ADHD, you, you recognize that your biggest weaknesses are sitting in meetings and listening to people talk. You cannot focus on someone talking um, or... Um, yeah, that's the main thing. Like you can't do meetings, but you can, if you can, you know, sit in your office with your door closed, you can get into your zone and here's another one. And then, but if people are interrupting you a lot, then you, you're just, it's over. Okay. So knowing that if you know, if you have more control over your schedule such that on, you know, every afternoon you have meetings or you have meetings three afternoons a week then you might be someone who decides, okay, I will take my Adderall only um, three days a week at work, or I'll take it Monday through Friday, 
uh, only, and I'll take the immediate release just in the mornings on Monday through Friday. Um, but then on those two afternoons a week where we have meetings, I will also take that second dose. Why would someone, I know this isn't your question, it's my follow-up question. So why would someone even want to do that? Like, why not just take it every day? Because um, for some people, tolerance is not an issue. I have some patients who've taken the same dose. But for many people, that's not the case. If you take it every day, after a while, what used to work, the dose that used to work, isn't as effective. So taking a break from it, whether that break just be like weekends only, you get you take you get off and then you start back on Monday, um, or you know just kind of random days that you don't take it, that slows down the tolerance process. So I usually recommend for my own patients, that if you can find times where you don't need to take it, then don't take it if it doesn't cause problems for you. There are some people who will get into a car accident if they don't take their stimulant because they're not paying close enough attention. So for that person, if you drive every day, you should take it every day. So um, another downside, and I've seen this quite a bit, in taking it every day if you don't need it every day, is if you say um, go on vacation, the withdrawal, and you decide, I don't wanna to to take Adderall on vacation. Um, the withdrawal effects from getting off of Adderall or being without it after you take it consistently can either be extreme irritability or extreme fatigue, like you can barely get out of bed. So you can, and I've seen this, someone takes it most days or every day, goes on vacation for a week and they feel like they lost the first three days of their vacation because they spent it super exhausted and not being able to get out of bed. Um, and some people just give up and just be like, well, fine, I'll just take it on vacation because I want to enjoy my vacation. So if that person though was more in the habit or their, their body was used to on off, on off, on off, it wouldn't be such a dramatic change for them to go on vacation and go seven days without it. So um, it really is a personal decision whether you take it every day or not. Um, I just tried to outline some reasons to not take it every day if you don't have to. Thanks for that question. All right, MP, let's talk about it. Thank you so much for the super chat. I don't know why I have to put on my glasses for this one, not the other one. Um, thank you again for the super chat. I, uh, I really appreciate it. As a 24-year-old man going through financial hardships, family dysfunction, and life problems as a young adult, what would you say is the best way to handle the stress or keep the stress levels low? Okay, so handling stress for someone who um, is having financial hardship and family dysfunction. Uh, hmm, okay, so that's... Um, I always say multifactorial in that there's not going to be one thing that that does it for you. I will say, so if you have very little control over some of the stressors, so the stressors, you know, in this scenario would be the financial hardships, the family dysfunction, whatever that is, you know, maybe family relationship issues, not people not getting along, something like that. I'm just kind of guessing. Those are things that you may or may not have much control over. I would start at is what are the things you do have control over? Um, are there ways to minimize uh, contact with some of the people who are causing drama or maybe toxic or things like that? Trying to find ways to um, protect yourself by lessening your exposure. Then, um, you know, with the financial hardships, that might also be a situation where you have very little control, or maybe you do have some control over it. Trying to find ways to intervene and make adjustments for the things that you can control, even if those things that you do don't eliminate the problem, because that's not the goal here is just to make stuff go away, because this is life. It's to make it more manageable. So that's one approach is, you know, from the top down approach. Uh, looking at the problems that are causing you distress and seeing what you can control and what you can manage with it to reduce your exposure to those things. 
and get some relief from them. Then the bottom side up uh, approach would be then how do you manage your, how do you deal with how it affects you? So um, then it's still kind of taking the approach of self-protection and trying to, and self-care really. So um, trying to maximize uh, downtime or carve out time that you can uh, recharge or have time to yourself if you're the kind of person who needs peace and quiet to feel um, rejuvenated. The person who tends to be more introverted needs quiet time in their head um, and time to think. Um, and so if you know, not having any of that, or you find yourself, you're doing this, you're doing this, you're always thinking about this, you always have stuff to do. For that scenario, it's about trying to um, compartmentalize things in a way that you can still reserve some time uh, to be able to um, get out of depletion mode and rejuvenate and feel more, you know, fulfilled. That time could be just spent quietly or doing stuff that gives you pleasure because you have to have some balance between um, stress and hard work and things that satisfy you and make you feel good. If you're more on the extroverted or extroverted side where um, you gain energy from connections with people and doing things with people, it doesn't mean that the person is introverted unlike people. So that's, I just want to clear that. But you get to, the extrovert person can be more depleted from isolation and not being able to talk to people and things like that. So for you, it would be instead of trying to carve out time to yourself, it's carve out time to spend with people so that you can fill your cup back up. Um, so the moral of the story is uh, trying to manage the stressors as best you can. And then also trying to find ways to keep your cup full so that you can, you know, put on your armor and charge back out there and, you know, slay through the day, another day of this stuff. Um, and then, you know, come back home and do it all again. But you can't keep doing it if your cup isn't full. That's my generic answer to that. Thank you. All right. DK says, hello, Dr. Marks, what treatment do you suggest for constant rumination? Constant rumination. So I'm assuming, DK, that you are talking about depressive rumination, because oftentimes that's kind of what we associate with ruminating. But uh, some people will categorize excessive worry and fretting as ruminative thinking as well, uh, regardless of which one. Um, so, well, no, I shouldn't say regardless. So if it's more in the depressive mode, depressed, like, um, you know, I'm not good enough. Uh, I'm not, I'm, you know, things where you're, you're, you're thinking negatively about lots of things, whether it be about yourself, your situation, and making all these assumptions and going over and over in your head. Um, if you are not depressed, like if you're, if you're talking about what do I recommend from a non-medication point of view, so medication point of view would be if you're depressed, um, get evaluated to see if being on an antidepressant would help you because helping your depression would then also help the rumination. But you're still left with um, that that is your tendency when you get depressed to ruminate. So to break the cycle of that, um, you would look to do things that um, kind of break up, um, break up, um, I guess, distraction. So ways to distract your thoughts from kind of going in that direction. Kind of what I was just getting hung up on was, um, try not to get too detailed here, but so a part of our brain called the default mode network is a is, or structures in the brain that click on when we don't have anything else to think about. So when we're not intentionally thinking about something, you kind of go into this, okay, your brain will just give you something to think about. So people who 
tend to be more ruminative, their default mode network just kind of goes crazy um, with stuff, whether it be anxious thoughts or depressive thoughts that keep your mind occupied. Okay, so you want to do things that keep your default mode from turning on. So mindfulness. Uh, I probably say that a million times all the time. You've probably heard it a million times, but mindfulness is really just the state of being fully present in the moment. We tend to mindlessly do things. So I'm driving to work and I'm thinking about the stuff I have to do later versus driving and, and focusing on, well, I am focusing on the road, but like focusing on the traffic in front of me, the color of the car in front of me, the temperature in my car, um, how comfortable is my seat cushion? Like all of these, these things that have to do with what I'm presently doing versus future thinking or future planning. Um, so the more we tend to future think and future plan, the easier, the, the, the more the, the tendency to then start worrying about stuff or, or negatively thinking about things. So bring, getting into the practice of bringing yourself into the current moment of what am I doing right now? It could be washing dishes instead of again, washing dishes and thinking about, you know, I should have spoke to this person. I should have done this. And then at, while you're washing dishes, think about how, think about the, the way you kind of zone into mindful thinking is to use all of your senses and kind of do like an inventory of what your senses are experiencing. So if I'm washing dishes, um, you know, the color of the plate, uh, the temperature of the water, is it steamy? Um, the slipperiness of the soap, you know, focusing on that kind of stuff, focusing on all those little details, including in engaging all of your senses in that keeps your mind off of all of that other stuff. Now, granted, you can't always, you can't just always walk around. You've got to do some planning. You know, you do have to think about um, what time do I need to start getting ready if I'm going to leave to show up on time for something. But still, that is focused thought on that. What you're trying to do is get out of your head when it comes to um, running, playing back scenarios. Or, you know, I, I can't, I don't know exactly what you're, you're, you are ruminating about, but generally it can be self-critical things, thinking about things you did, should have done, didn't do all of that stuff. So um, putting yourself in more of a mindful um, frame of thought when you find yourself thinking this way is one thing. Um other types of, uh, and then, you know, there's just getting more involved in activities that distract you, whether that be taking walks, exercising, um, you know, doing your chores around the home, but focusing on that chore, that kind of thing. So um, long story short, it's about distracting yourself and getting out of your head and focusing on the moment. That would be kind of one thing I would suggest for addressing um, ruminative thoughts, and as well as the anxious thoughts as well. I, I know I focused on the, the negative ruminations, but the anxious thoughts as well. Thank you for that question. Tiger Lily, so happy you're doing a live now. Thanks, Tiger. I'm glad you're here for it. May Chan, love all that you've ever done. Thank you, May. Really weird question. What's the best type of therapy treatment for depression caused by an incurable disease or lifetime disease? Hmm. So um, I may not be able to give you the best answer, May, because there are so many therapies out there. Um, so let me see one more time. Um, depression that's caused by an incurable disease. So um, I'm pausing because there's kind of two approaches to this, well, two answers kind of. One is, um, this may not be where you're going with this, but just because it, if you have depression it, and it 
when it comes to treating it medically, I know you're talking about therapy, but medically, it doesn't matter as much the cause for it. It's not like it's a different kind of depression because it came from an incurable disease versus um, a biologically based depression that is not connected to any kind of physical ailment, okay? Uh, if it is connected to a physical ailment, then yes, treatment also um, uh, is your treatment also requires that the physical thing also be treated. Okay, so that's kind of the main difference there. But I just want to, uh, I'm saying this because uh, I don't know if part of your question is, well, if you get depressed because this happened, um, you know, does that make your depression different? Okay, so past that, um, as far as like working through your depression, I would think um, someone who is focused on um, grief, kind of, because even though it's not grieving the loss of a person, you are grieving, you may be grieving the loss of your previous health status. If you've got something that's incurable, and it's something that causes death, because in theory, a lot of stuff is incurable. Um, depression isn't curable. You can go into remission, um, but it's not cure in the, cured in the sense that uh, you get it treated and then it never comes back. It might not for some people, but many people it does. It's a recurring illness. But if, if you're talking about a disease that is that causes death, then you've got to cope with um, living with something that is going to end your life sooner than you expected it to. Um, there's also uh, therapies out there that focus on um, illness, managing chronic uh, disorders that don't necessarily cause death, like chronic pain and things like that. I don't know that those have some specific name to them. Um, there, there, there might be. Uh, but I just don't know what those names would be because those therapies coming up all the time. But I would say, you know, if you were looking for a therapist, the best way to just do it rather than try and figure out what a, what what kind of therapy and trying to find a therapist who does that, you could um, look at a therapist who works with people dealing with um, dealing with chronic illnesses um, and managing their lives through those chronic illnesses. Uh, and and that person should be able to tell you if they're equipped to do that. And and one more thing about that, probably the approach or one approach would be from a cognitive behavior perspective or, or point of view, because you're changing your thought about or managing your thought about having this illness and and what your life and outlook is because of it. And then you may need to change some behaviors that, that are not serving you well because of having this illness. Okay, that's a high level view of the kind of therapy. Okay, Hill Kidney 7. Hi, Dr. Marks, love all your videos and have been a long time subscriber, thank you. How can I reframe my tarnished character acquired from negative experiences and, uh, Propos, maybe people, oh, people's opinions who keep blaming shame. Oh, wow. <laughs> okay, wait, hold on. Let me read this again. The power of the internet and, and um, mental health information. People are learning more. This is great. Okay, so let me get back to this. How can I reframe my tarnished character acquired from negative experiences and people's opinions who keep blaming shame? So. Um, if I'm hearing you correctly, you're saying that um, people shame you with criticism and negative opinions of you and things, and the, I take it they're saying this to your face, and how can you, so, the, so where I'm stuck is, how can I reframe my tarnished character? Character in your own eyes, like how you see yourself? or character based on what people think about you because of what other people are saying about you. 
um, it's hard. You can't really, um, you don't have a lot of control over what other people are going to think of you. You just have to do your thing, shine your light, and if they see it, they see it. If they don't, they don't. Um, however, if the issue is more that uh, people, you started to believe what people say because they just make you feel bad and you start to kind of, that becomes part of your own narrative of this is who you are. Um, reframing that for yourself, uh, I don't see it as reframing. I see it as blocking um, what people are saying because you don't need them to, to show you or tell you who you are. If you don't have a good sense of who you are, what you stand for, your strength, um, then it's going to be easy to just let other people assign those things to you um, and, and tell you who you are, what you, what you stand for, and, and, and focus on your weaknesses. So perhaps if you struggle with that, of like, um, you know, it, uh, accepting or owning shame, the stuff that people say, people's criticism and feeling shame all the time, um, I would say one of the ways to dig out of that would be to focus on your strength. Because we all have weaknesses. And so, you know, people can... Um, shout my weaknesses all day long. It's not going to make me feel bad. Um, but I don't have to live in that every day of, okay, well, okay, well, yeah. So you're going to focus on the fact that I can't do this, but I'm going to focus on the fact that I can do this other thing. And yeah, I can't do that other thing. Okay, we can't do everything. No one can do everything. Um, so I'm going to you need to find a way to thrive in um, the things that you're good at. And uh, this kind of goes back to an answer I was saying about uh, another question, which is minimizing exposure to the things that you're not good at. So if you know that you're not, you know, it's hard to kind of not have a concrete example here, but if, um, uh, let's see, I'm trying to think of one where, you know, a shaming comment, but, um, if I know that uh, I'm not good at this thing and somebody's always kind of, you, you didn't do this, blah, 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 or something, and, you know, I feel bad, um, I, I'm going to want to minimize my exposure to those people. Now, maybe I can't. Maybe there's somebody that I'm going to live with or work with every day. Um, so it's going to be about trying to, the fact, you know, going back to the reframing, I'm sorry, I'm kind of all over the place here, but, um, you know, you don't want to diagnose people, but at the same time, you, you, you can't ignore what you see in front of you. People who need to shame you need to do that because they need, that's what they need to feel good about themselves, you know. So if you see someone make a mistake or do something bad, um, Yes, you can give people negative feedback because it may help them, but if you need to put somebody down or step on them, like what, what, what's the value in that? And when people do that a lot, it says more about them. So even, even though I get that, yeah, kind of like that sticks and stones may break my bones and that doesn't really make me feel better saying that little ditty. Um, still the truth is, is that uh, I, I guess a way you could reframe their behavior is to see it as, sadly, this is what this person or these people need to do to kind of validate their own insecurity. And if it makes you look bad, because what makes you look bad makes them feel good in some way. That's that. But you're not going to be able to change that. And you're not going to be able to fix people and get them to not do that. So what you have to do is just keep saying to yourself, it's them, let them say their stuff, but this is me, 
this is why I feel good about myself and reinforce um, these positive qualities in your, that you see in yourself by doing more things that reinforce that, yeah, you're good at this, and so that's why you're doing it. Um, so it's about, again, it's going back to exposure, maximizing your exposure to things that operate in your strength, people who lift you up, minimizing your exposure to the people who try to tear you down and block um, owning the stuff that they say, even if there's a little bit of truth in it. But again, we all have weaknesses, but someone um, throwing your weakness in your face to make you feel bad it, uh, is their problem, but that, that they have to handle it that way. Okay, I'm rambling. I hope that was helpful. This is what Charles is doing. Your mic is sounding a little low and stanky. Yep, it's low. Okay, so let me, I'm going to switch. My, I'm having a mic problem. Let me let me try some stuff on my end. Okay. All right. Okay. Um Mm, it's still low. Uh, All right. Unmute your mic on your end. Okay. There we go. That's, is that better? Okay, so I do have, um, I'm using my webcam mic right now. And then, yeah, that's the only one that's working. Okay, let's do it that way. Sorry right. about that, guys. All right, let's ask the chat. How does she sound? Can you guys hear me? Probably has the room echo, but that's all right. They can hear you. They can hear me. Okay, great. Yep. So let's continue. Sorry about that staticiness. Technology. <laughs> exactly. All right, here we go. All right. All right. Claudesia, thank you for the super chat. Hi, Tracy. Been following for years. Thank you. I used to suffer heavily with panic disorder and agoraphobia. Your channel saved my life. Today, oh, that's wonderful. Thank you, Claudesia. Today, I'm going to school to be a psych nurse. Awesome. Thank you for letting me know that. Like, you know, somebody, I was talking to somebody just the other day, and um, I was just saying how, like, hearing stories like this about the impact of just getting basic mental health education is just you know gives me so much satisfaction and pleasure oops oh my bra strap shine. sorry um i just like this is it just doesn't get any better than this for me 
So congratulations, Claudesia. I'm so glad your, your panic is under control now. And, um, and also, I'm glad you're going to be a psych nurse. We need more of you. Thank you. Tint Braille, thank you for the super chat. Will increasing dopamine and serotonin help me with social anxiety? And what could I take? Increasing dopamine and serotonin with social anxiety. All right. So thanks for that question, Tim. Um, what we have seen with, with uh, anxiety, the most helpful um, uh, neurotransmitter is serotonin. So the medications that we use to treat anxiety for uh, the, 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 the medications that we use to treat anxiety are the antidepressants. The only antidepressant that also increases dopamine is Wellbutrin. Bupropion is the, the generic name. It, it can help some people, but it's not the best because of the fact that it's stimulating. It tends, it can make anxiety worse. So I would not think that focusing on increasing dopamine helps anxiety except anxiety that's brought upon from someone who's got ADHD and has low dopamine levels in certain parts of the brain. And because of that, kind of like the downstream effect is anxiety. So there are some people who have ADHD, it's untreated, they struggle with it, and they have a lot of anxiety. This isn't your, and that's not social anxiety, but have a lot of anxiety, they get their ADHD treated and their anxiety resolves, okay? Um, social anxiety could also be treated with beta blockers. Okay, so wait, before I do that, sorry. Um, so going, just to kind of finish that train of thought though with the, the serotonin enhancing agents. So the antidepressants that increase serotonin. So that would be the serotonin reuptake inhibitors like um, Prozac, Lexapro, um, Zoloft, even Cymbalta or Effects, or all those are serotonin enhancing antidepressants. Beta blockers, on the other hand, are medications that are used to treat um, like blood pressure, heart issues and things. Psychi in psychiatry, we use it to, it, re it reduces adrenaline. So we use it for people who have physical symptoms with their anxiety. Where this could tie in with social anxiety is if you um, tend to um, like have serious trouble like going in, in a group and then having lots of heart racing, flushing, um, could barely speak. Um, social anxiety is called social and performance anxiety. So it's not always about being around people and second guessing yourself and worrying about what people are thinking and, and so on. That's one aspect of it. Another aspect, the performance part is being unable to do stuff in around other people like speak in a group um, or any kind of performance, even work with people looking at you or something like that. So in, in that scenario, if you have a lot of physical symptoms that then make you kind of just collapse under the pressure and not be able to perform, um, things like taking something like propranolol is the typical one that we will use, uh, maybe metoprolol, but, or, or sorry, pendolol is another one that, that will be used, not so much metoprolol, but propranolol is kind of the go-to. It will change your physical symptoms. So it will like reduce your heart rate, keep you from flushing in front of people. And if by doing that, if by controlling your physical stuff, that enables you to go ahead and perform, whether that performance be talking to people or whatever it is, then that's another way that your social anxiety could be treated. The thing though about going the beta blocker approach where you're, you're treating the physical issues, it does not really address what's going on in your head though. So if your social anxiety is really driven more by thoughts about what people are thinking and you know, trying to anticipate uh, what they're gonna say and making assumptions about their people are judging you and that kind of thing, it doesn't really do much for that. And that's where the antidepressants tend to work better for that. All right. 
Next question. Thanks for that. Okay, Kai Wen. I think that's how you pronounce it. Um, thank you for the super chat. After a trauma of losing a loved one from a car accident, oh, I'm sorry about that. I was not, I was, I was not even in the car. I now have panic attacks when I drive. Is exposure therapy the best treatment and how should it be done? Okay, thanks for that uh, question. Again, I'm sorry for your loss. And you know, you can develop um, post-traumatic stress symptoms, you know, whether or not it's the full-blown disorder or not, but you can have a trauma reaction even when you were not in the car, kind of either from witnessing or even learning about, um, you know, the death of someone or someone being attacked. Um, so this is not uncommon to kind of end up having this, this reaction. Um, so exposure therapy, yes, I would say of the, the trauma-based um, treatments, probably exposure uh, therapy would be the best one. And the way it would be done is your therapist would come up with, um, assuming you have a therapist, would come up with um, kind of like a graduated um, schedule of what you could be doing. So you're, you're, you're just going in little baby steps. So let's say, and, and that person would start by finding out the circumstances of the panic attack. So is it, you know, is it the distance that you're driving that's, that triggers the panic attacks? You know, the further away you get from home, the more you start to have it. Is it when you get in the high, on the highway, is it only at traffic lights? You know, that kind of thing. Like look at the circumstances that trigger your panic attacks. What makes your panic attacks better? Is it only after you just like pull over and that's what does it? Or is it, you know, is it something that you do? Those little details would factor into how the exposure exercises would work. So let's say for you, it's, um, you're okay driving around in your neighborhood, but it's when you when there's a lot of cars on the road, or it's in an intersection. Let's say that um, it's when you get to an intersection, you start feeling your heart race. You're not sure if you should press on the brake, even though the light's green. Like you get all freaked out, and um, maybe you start to dissociate, like feeling like you're floating, and now you feel like you're going to have an accident. Okay, hypothetical scenario. Um, the exercises then would be would be like um this is just hypothetical spend 10 minutes driving around your neighborhood like in, in, let's say you say well that doesn't bother me okay that's okay do that then the next level would be um you know turning on to um a certain kind of road nearby um still kind of keeping it somewhat safe you're still not far from where where you feel safe you, you kind of want it. So what I'm doing is coming up with way, with steps that get increasingly more scary and threatening for you. Um, so let's say you, again, if the, the hot button is the intersection, you're going to do exercises that, that practice getting close to an intersection first. And then it might be, you know, step number three or something might be going through an intersection, then you pull over, you manage your anxiety, you know, you breathe, you um, do some grounding exercises, whatever it is that would address the anxiety you feel from that. Um, and then come back home and then do it again. And you keep doing it until you um, feel more comfortable with it and are having less anxiety. Now, it might not get to where you have no anxiety. You still might be like going through the intersection like, uh, but you make it through as opposed to you're not hyperventilating. You're not like seeing like blinking lights or, you know, flashing lights in your eyes and things like that. Like none of that's happening, but you still feel some angst. Okay, that's progress. Then the next step might be, um, okay, that was a little, little small intersection. Um, like, you know, a small intersection might be a four-way stop with no light. A bigger intersection might be a light, but it's still a small, not a lot of traffic. And then you graduate to a, a, a much larger intersection. So that's just, uh, so 
the idea is that, again, you are finding steps that are increasingly anxiety provoking for you and you keep doing them and you do each step over and over until it becomes until you become desensitized because it's like old hat now. It's like, OK, I got this. And then you move to the next one. That is probably um, that it's not hard to do. I mean, sorry, it's not easy to do. It is hard. And it can take a while so you have to be patient the practice would be like you know um preferably every day but certainly multiple times a week um that you keep practicing to then get to the next level um and uh yeah it could take you, you could backslide you know and like be good at one point and then take some time off and then you go back to that intersection you're like uh i'm getting that that feeling again and then you've got to kind of go back a step and and practice that old step again to then advance to the next so all that to say um this is something that could take months a second option um would probably be um emdr but in in emdr eye movement desensitization reprocessing therapy helps process trauma it helps um, reprocess how you, it helps your brain reprocess the experience to kind of to dampen down the hyperactivity of the um of, of your response to it so you have a a heightened response to driving because of the way this affected you the um, emdr works more at the level of like changing how your brain sees this so that you don't erupt in panic versus brute force getting you to just keep doing this thing until you're desensitized. So, um, so that's a secondary, that's a different approach. You might not like the exposure part. It just might be too hard to push through, in which case then EMDR may be a better option. Thanks for that question. Richard, hello, your videos are awesome. Thank you, Richard. Thank you very much. All right, Nurse Adrian RN, been watching you since early days, so appreciate your presence. Thank you. I have quite a contingency of people who uh, have been watching for a while, and that's that's wonderful, and that keeps me keeps me producing. Um, Myla, when does aromatherapy when does aromatherapy videos are coming? Oh, funny. Um, because you know I love aromatherapy, and maybe that's why you're asking that. Um, you know, I did one several years ago. Uh I could do another one. I could add that to my list of to-dos. Um I'd have to kind of I, whenever I do a video, I like to have an angle, like why am I talking about this versus just let's just talk about this kind of thing. Um, and I don't know. So thanks for that suggestion. It's probably time for another aromatherapy video, like the one that I did was several years old. So um, thanks for that suggestion. Brian, thank you for the super chat, Brian. Good morning. Uh, morning. <laughs> uh, doctor, I've recently been diagnosed with ADHD as an adult, age 31. I hear many pros to taking medication for ADHD. Um, are there any cons that I should be aware of before seeking medication? Love your channel. Thank you for this info. You're welcome, Brian. So um, yes, there are cons to taking medication. There's cons to taking any medication, actually. And, and here's the cons. Hold on, let me get a sip of water. So the mainstay of medications, Brian, for ADHD are non-stimulants and stimulants. Okay, so the stimulants, um, the two main ones out there, or I shouldn't main ones, the two out there are uh, Stratera, Atomoxetine is the name, generic name, and then Kelbre, it's spelled Q-E-L-B-R-E-E, -E, and I forgot the generic name for that. It's still brand. It's only been out a couple of years. Both of these drugs you have to take every single day 
and they work to improve, um, to increase uh, dopamine in your brain, but to then improve your focus, attention, motivation. And in fact, uh, I did a, a recent uh, video not too long ago talking about Kelbury that some studies have shown uh, when they were comparing it to atomoxetine, Stratera, that it was better at addressing some of the executive functions than even Stratera was. I think that the stimulants are not that great at addressing executive functions. Uh, some executive functions, so it can, it's good at focus, concentration, and motivation, which is an executive function motivation. But the time management, organization, um, those things not quite so good. Um, the stimulants are easier to take in the sense that you don't have to take them every day, kind of like I was talking about earlier for someone who has chunks of time where it doesn't really matter if they're not that focused, so they can go without the medicine. Um, and it works, they work quickly. So they work within like half an hour to an hour and they work for a certain amount of time and then it wears off and you're done. So for someone who, who kind of likes to have a little bit more control over how long something is in their system, um, and I guess, you know, I, my population of patients, I have a number of people who, who feel that way. Um, having something that's kind of like an on off switch. I take this, it works, it's off and I'm good. I'm fine without it. Then the stimulants are a good way, a good option for you that way. Cause you have more control, um, of when you take it and when it's effective. A downside though is that some of the stimulants can people can feel an emotional crash afterwards and that can be a really big deal for some people uh, i've seen it more in children and adolescents i don't treat children but seen it more in like the adolescents and i think it's because in, in young adults and i think it's because of the still developing brain i think uh kids and um and young adults just take a bigger hit when it comes to the effects or the withdrawal effects of the medicine or the wearing off effect. But yeah, some people, um, they'll experience an emotional crash when the medicine wears off and they can't stand that. So they may take a long acting medication. I've still had some people say though that when they take it, it makes them feel down. So they don't necessarily have the crash with the long acting one but they'll, they'll, they'll feel like their personality has changed, like they're not as expressive and things and that they don't like that. Um, I do think I've had a couple people report some um, sexual side effects with the stimulants. Um, so from that point of view, you know, you're just looking at as far as a downside to taking stimulants, just, um, medication side effects. Every med can have a side effect. And uh, I guess an upside is with the stimulants where you don't have to take them every day, you can quickly get a sense of whether you like them or don't. And if you don't, then you just don't take them anymore. It's not like with Stratera or Kelbury, you've got to take it every day and you've got a buildup effect, kind of like antidepressants. And so it may be a few weeks before you see both the, the um, improvement as well as get a sense of how it makes you feel so it takes a little bit longer to sort that out than with the stimulants it's kind of like kind of like taking pain pills you take the pain pill the pain goes away it wears off the pain comes back with the stimulants it's kind of like that you kind of get immediate feedback um, without a lot of long-term effect if you only take it for a little while so if you're going to experiment or I guess I shouldn't say experiment. If you're going to see if you think you like or want to take a medicine, the stimulants are the easier ones to get a quick sense of, do I like this or not? And keep in mind, if you are going to go down this road, there are multiple types of stimulants and they don't all make you feel the same way. So um, there's amphetamine stimulants, amphetamine category of stimulants, that'd be things like Adderall, Vivant, um, Evicchio, um, uh, Dexedrine, old, very old one. 
So that's one category. And then there's um, the, uh, um, the Ritalin methylphenidate category. Ritalin, Focalin, um, there's, there's some other brand names. I hardly end up going all the way down the road of all the different um, methylphenidate because, and there's more than you asked for, but um, for adults, the uh, amphetamine drugs tend to work a little bit better because it, it activates more uh, uh, dopamine receptors than the methylphenidate. So you get more, I guess you get more dopamine release with the amphetamine ones. Um, that said, they can also be a little bit more stimulating than the methylphenidate. So I call the methylphenidate category a little kinder, gentler. Um, so, you know, I've had some patients who couldn't tolerate the uh, amphetamine stimulants. They made them to feel too amped up, trouble sleeping. These are also other side effects I didn't mention before. Um, loss of appetite. Um, which some people like, but then people who don't need to lose weight can end up not liking the fact that they can't eat and then they're losing, they're looking really thin. Um, I think that the methylphenidate tend to do that less. Okay, long answer to that medication question. I hope that helps. All right, Roman Jeremiah, thank you for the super chat. Thank you so much for all your videos. You're welcome. Can you advise if TRT, test testosterone replacement therapy, is comparable, or sorry, is compatible with bipolar disorder type two and ADHD? Okay, um, the quick answer to that Roman would be yes. There isn't like some um, known or, or just, typical, uh, we call them contraindications when something, it's not advised that someone takes something with something else. Um, as far as compatibility though, like it, would it cause a problem? Um, so with bipolar disorder, uh, sorry, with the testosterone replacement therapy, if you don't replace your testosterone, it could make your bipolar disorder harder to manage because um, testosterone, low testosterone levels can look like depression in men, um, or, well, it's men who get that, but um, can look like depression. And um, not exactly the same kind of symptoms, but it can be harder to get to feel like you're coming out of the depression if you also have low testosterone. So you kind of want to have your hormone levels be um, brought to normal as normal levels as possible for optimal functioning um, and optimal treatment of anything mental. Um, a, a, a way it, the, it can go, uh, one way that it can complicate things though, is the best way to put this, is too much testosterone can cause irritability and um, an and increased aggression, and which could then perhaps look like mania, or maybe even if you were in, I don't know about triggering mania per se, but if you were um, in a manic state or hypomanic state, um, if you if your testosterone was too high, um, it could make then your mania or hypomania harder to treat as well. So there's a lot of there would be a, a, a strong need for um, there to be a lot of oversight between your psychiatrist and the doctor prescribing the testosterone to make sure that there's a balance um, so that potential side effects of your testosterone replacement therapy isn't interfering or aggravating your bipolar disorder, whether it be the depressed phase or the, um, or the manic or hypomanic phase. Um, because depression, people can become irritable in depression as well. And so, you know, is if you were getting irritable, like, is that because of your testosterone status or is that your depression needs to be, uh, your, your bipolar disorder meds need to be adjusted. So, um, 
So it's just a matter of your, your psychiatrist being aware that you're getting testosterone placement therapy and kind of keeping that in the back of their head when symptoms come up to sort out, okay, which is causing what. It may not always be clear what the answer is, but looking at a timeline of um, your medication, you know, what dose you're on and were there any changes? And now here you've got this going on, like that's kind of how they would try and figure that out. As far as ADHD goes, um, I can't really see, I can't think of a scenario where it would interfere or, or, or aggravate ADHD, except again, going back to um, <clears throat> the dose being too high, which is, that's not usually the case that people end up getting too much. Often, at least in my experience, observing people on testosterone treatment, because I don't treat people for testosterone deficiency, is that um, people I've seen, it's, we have, they have trouble getting up high enough dose. It's like, okay, you increase the dose, I'm good, but then they dip a little again, and then they got to keep getting the dose increased more so than they get testosterone replacement therapy and they're just like bouncing off the walls because it's too high. Um, what was I going to say about that? Oh, but um, just as low testosterone can interfere with your, can make you have a low mood, irritability, it can also uh, cause some brain fog that then could mimic your ADHD symptoms. So if you already have ADHD and then you've got um, brain fog on top of that from low testosterone, then it's the low testosterone state that causes a problem for your ADHD more so than getting that testosterone replaced. So moral of this story is um, in general, unless you've got some exceptions here because of other medical issues, it would be ideal to have your testosterone replaced to get your low testosterone love, uh, state treated for optimal um, treatment of your bipolar disorder and ADHD. Like both of those will be happy if your testosterone is normalized with medicate with replacement therapy. All righty, what we got next? We got um, my email. Uh, if you want to be a part of my email community or email list where I send out um, weekly, mostly weekly, sometimes I miss a week, but mostly weekly um, information and try and keep you up to date on things, uh, you can go to getmentalhealthtips.com and that will put you in my, on my email list um, to stay connected to me. Okay, Isai, I hope I pronounced that right. I say, Dr. Marks, let me thank, let me just thank you for your videos on different platforms. Definitely helped and still help me. You're welcome. Thank you. You have just, you just have that sense of safety, that vibe. I really appreciate that. Thank you. I, I like having that kind of vibe. Want people to feel safe. Christina Rainbow, I think you're an amazing person and you have helped me. Thank you. You are so welcome, Christina. Thank you. Use, sorry if I mispronounced that. You're awesome, Dr. Marks. Your content is so informative. Thank you. Wow. I'm not good with compliments. It's like a love fest. No, I mean, I really, I really appreciate it. I need to get better at like accepting compliments. Okay. You're feeling some of my issues here. All right. Jules, um, thank you for the super chat. In addition to seeing a therapist twice a month, taking antidepressants and working out twice a week, what more can I do to invest in my mental health? Okay. Very good. Well, good for you. So you're taking antidepressants, working out twice a week. I would say um, the next two big things um, that don't have anything to do with medication are your diet and your sleep. So um, those are kind of like the big three, exercise, diet, and sleep. And those all sound non-exciting and maybe even boring, but it, that, that you just can't get around it. So when it comes to diet, 
you're looking at um, maximizing or having as clean of a diet as you can. So eating food as close to nature as possible, reducing, um, reducing additives and uh, preservatives and things like that. So people will say you, you want to, when you go to the grocery store, you want to shop the perimeter and spend less time in the center where all the packaged goods are. Um, hey, I love some barbecue potato chips like the next person, and it's hard to resist that stuff. But um, those, sadly, um, our westernized diet um, has is just jam-packed full of unhealthy stuff. And also, unfortunately, it's much easier and cheaper to eat bad food than it is to eat healthy food. It's a lot of work to uh, buy fresh food and cook it than it is to just go through the drive-thru. But, so it doesn't have to be all or nothing though. So it's not like you can never, for me, I, it's not like I'm never gonna have a potato chip, but um, I wanna keep that stuff to a minimum. So, you know, you could start out if you have like, if, you've, if, you've, if you haven't pressed the brakes or pumped the brakes on any of your eating, start small couple of days a week, try and eat cleanly, maximizing your vegetable intake. We don't eat enough vegetables in this country. Maximizing your vegetable intake, try and like maybe you could start with adding, um, if you don't eat vegetables at all, at least one vegetable meal. But if you already eat vegetables, maybe add another vegetable um, to your current meal. So you have two vegetables. Um, and then maybe singling out a day or a couple of days a week where you will not have anything packaged um, that's not a whole food based. So, um, you know, you you won't have any crackers or something, you know, that, that I'm just kind of brainstorming out loud here. But start with cleaning up your diet and having set aside days where you're going to eat whatever free like whatever it is that you nor that you eat that you recognize is not good don't eat that on like a couple of days a week or something until you can get to the point where it's predominantly gone from your diet but maybe you have some days where you indulge um then the sleep would be about prioritizing um prioritizing your sleep so that you plan for it. So instead of sleep being something that happens when you are finished at the end of the day, it becomes something that you focus your whole day around. So my, you know, just, let's just say, let's say your bedtime is, it needs to be 11 o'clock because you need seven hours of sleep. And so you get up at six and get off to work and so on and so forth. So if you know that you need to be unconscious by 11, then you need to plan uh, an hour before that at 10 to start winding down because you don't want to say bedtime is at 11 so at 10 50 you're getting in bed or you're brushing your teeth to get ready to go to bed um so you want to start an hour you want to have an hour wind down so that first half an hour can be just like you know, whatever you do to prepare for bed, you're turning off television, you're brushing your teeth, putting on your clothes, whatever you do. And then that second half hour is in the bed with the lights off, trying to go to sleep because the average amount of time to fall asleep, which is called sleep latency, is between 15 minutes and kind of 30 max. It's really 15 to 20 minutes, but I just say 30 max. If it takes you longer than that, then you have sleep onset insomnia you have trouble falling asleep that's how long it's supposed to take us to fall asleep if our bodies are ready to fall asleep if you get into a routine your body should let you fall asleep if you're lying there in the dark um so so yeah so that last so that's 10 30 to 11 is in bed with the lights off um I start wearing uh, blue light blocking glasses two hours before I want to go to bed because, and so let's say my bedtime is 11. It's not really, it's supposed to be 10. But anyway, I'll, I'll put on my blue light blocking glasses at eight because I do want to go to bed by 10. Um, and why do I do that? Because even our um, 
compact, what do you call it, compact flash, that, that's not the right word, but our, the lights that we have uh, in the house have, emit a certain amount of blue light, uh, those fluorescent lights. Um, and the more blue light you have in your home, you could have some big old, you know, monstrosity television emitting all this light too, um, negatively affects your melatonin production. So it kind of delays the onset of melatonin, which is kind of the signal to your body that it's time to go to bed soon. Um, so so you, these are like little tweaks you could make, even if you're someone who you say, well, I sleep well, I would still say reinforce that good sleep by having a sleep plan. Like you actually, it is actually something you plan for. So you plan a bedtime. You plan a wind down time. Um, the, the glasses is just kind of an extra thing, but I do think it makes a difference, especially if you're one who in the evening you use your phone or a tablet. And even if you put your phone on night mode, I still think you're still better to get that blue light blocked. Um, and then I was gonna say one more thing about optimizing. Okay, so those are kind of natural things. Um, something you could look at or look into. I did a video talking about magnesium, but um, magnesium is one of those minerals that uh, it's easy for us to not get enough of, and magnesium is very um, instrumental and um, is it's one of those um, minerals that is very important in the production of certain neurochemicals like serotonin, dopamine, and all those. Um, and so people who have anxiety actually have been shown to waste magnesium, meaning you, your body gets rid of it faster than someone who doesn't have anxiety. So magnesium has been shown to be beneficial in people who have depression and anxiety. Um, and chances are you do not get enough of it with the food that you eat. Now, you don't have to take supplements but um, you could also look at making sure you eat that your diet that we talked about before is high in magnesium containing foods like green leafy vegetables which is why you could add another you know vegetable to your uh, plate and also um, pumpkin seeds is a very high um is a very um has a very high concentration it's blanking a very high concentration of magnesium for the small thing that it is. And so uh, you get a lot of mileage out of like becoming a pumpkin seed eater uh, to snack on. So those are some things to start with. All right, name. Thank you for the super chat name. How, how to treating ADHD symptoms without meds in a patient with thalassemia B minor, a blood disorder that causes insufficiently oxygenized red blood cells. Studies show thalassemia can cause ADHD. Okay, so first of all, name, thank you for explaining uh, to everyone what thalassemia B is. Um, so it, so another way of saying that uh, also is that it is a cause of anemia for people um which with anemia you can feel fatigue and um listlessness and things like that and brain fog and all of that okay so you know i'm not familiar with um studies showing that thalassemia itself causes adhd i'm not saying that doesn't i'm just saying i'm not familiar with that um it, i could see how the anemia could make people have difficulty focusing and remembering and 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 whatnot um but as far as it actually causing the disorder okay i'll take your word for it as far as treating the symptoms without meds so a non-medication okay so first of all you know it would be one approach would be trying whatever interventions there are to treat the thalassemia okay so if we take that off the table let's say that's done check um treating adhd 
without medications uh, typically involves, um, you could get coaching for executive function. There's lots of uh, coaches out there. Um, in fact, I'll shout out to my buddy, um, Sean McCormick. And he is with, I, uh, I hate, I don't have his uh, website up. I'll, you know, I'll, put, I'll probably put it in the notes. Executive, he's an executive function coaches. Sorry, Sean, I don't have your website uh, by heart. But it's like EF Specialist, I think, is, is the, uh, the website. But there are lots of um, executive function coaches out there that could help you with, um, with with seeing what the deficits are like seeing what the problems that you have are and helping you come up with some strategies to overcome those things or work with those limitations whatever they are so let's say um you know some so for some people i'm not sure if necessarily a coach would say this but maybe they would but um body doubling is a uh, kind of a common a thing that can help people what's body doubling it is having someone who's working on something sit with you or in, in, you know in our age it could be facetiming or some other way that you can see this person and they're doing work on their end and you're doing work on your end and just having this other person knowing that somebody else is there working like you're working can help you focus. Now that doesn't work for everyone, but it, it is, it can help for some people. And I've had some people tell me they really like doing that now that they've started doing it. It can help with the motivation. It may not necessarily help you stay focused on what you're doing. If what you're doing is something you don't want to do, but it can certainly help with the motivation. Like you've, you're kind of accountable to this person and they're, they're sitting there working. So, okay, I'll keep going. Um, one thing I talk about in a, a video that I did on, take a look at my um, ADHD, I uh, forgot what I called it, skills training or something, I think is what I call it. It's a playlist. There's not that many videos in there. But I talk about, um, setting up a reward system where you um, tackle tasks that you don't want to do um, because you know there's a reward coming and you're trying to get to the reward. So if I do this thing, you know, make this list right now for me, it's gathering forms for taxes, uh, searching on all these websites to get the download, the 1099. Um, I can't stand that. So, but if I put in front of me, okay, I'm just gonna, instead of keep putting that off, if I take the 20 minutes or whatever, it's gonna take for me to do that. Let me just do this. It's gonna be unpleasant. I'm gonna be irritated while I'm doing it. But then afterwards, I'm gonna go and do this other thing. So I'm just doing this because I'm looking forward to doing this other thing. And that other thing is what kind of pulls me through to get me to just go ahead and do this thing that I keep putting off, just as an example. Um, so that, but that's kind of an example of kind of a coaching, coachy kind of thing. So yeah, I would look into um, executive function coach to help you come up or this person come up with some strategies that are specific to the things that you struggle with, with the ADHD. All right, thanks for that question. All right, so F, Tepan, I don't wanna, I don't wanna botch your name. Thank you, F. <laughs> Lots of love and Belgian chocolate greetings from Brussels, thank you. My um, late mother-in-law is, was from Belgium. And uh, yeah miss her a lot uh but yeah we heard about belgium all the time cancer advocate hi dr marks thank you for your work and know that you are an inspiration to me you are welcome cancer thank you it's for people like you that i do this lisa willis i wish i could get my 20 year old son to see the importance of a schedule still the hurdle to work on yeah i know 
I hear you. Uh, I wish I could get my child to on a schedule. And, and even though I talk about all this stuff, um, I'm the one like, OK, you got to do this, you got to do this. And I realized I probably am not helping him get on a schedule because I'm 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 towing the line with reminders and reminders and reminders. But, um, you know, and that's kind of the mo the world of the mother, life of the mother. But um, sometimes um, since your, your child is 20, uh, sometimes this stuff is better. It's better accepted from a coach, like an independent person who has no skin in the game, um, is just trying to give them some uh, tips. And, you know, um, since I don't do executive function coaching per se, um, I don't know if there's, um, you know, if the structure is such that someone could get a lot out of three or four sessions and be done. Like, it's not like, you know, getting in psychoanalysis where you're just going to like, it's going to be years of this. Um, I do think it's focused enough that people could get um, some strategies. Now, granted, they'll have to implement them and, and, and be consistent. And some people, I guess, can stay in coaching because they need that accountability and they need someone to keep prodding them other than mother. <laughs> so, um, so yeah, I hear you on the wishing your child could get on a schedule. It's, it's, it's a, it's a hard sell. Eventually though, some people finally get it and see the utility in it and come up with their own version of that. All right, Tanya, thank you for the super chat. My question is, how much is too much medication? I'm currently taking 150 of Effexor, 100 of Lamictal, uh, 10 milligrams of Abilify, 10 milligrams of Propranolol, 50 milligrams of, okay. <laughs> All right, anyway, 50 milligrams of hydroxyzine, 0.5 clon clonazepam, 150 of trazodone, and 50 of Seroquel. Okay, the fact that I'm tired just reading that. All right, keep this up because I need to break this down. So, um, Tanya, yes, this is a lot. Now I'm not, I, you know, I got to tiptoe lightly here because I'm not trying to be critical of anyone's uh, treatment, okay? Sometimes people can end up on a lot of medications just because somebody forgot to dis discontinue something or you go to a different doctor or you've got multiple doctors prescribing stuff. And so, no, and people aren't communicating. So anyway, um, another reason people can end up with a lot of medication is when you have a lot of symptoms and perhaps there's not a clear diagnosis and the person is just is treating symptom by symptom. And so even though there's overlapping symptoms, it could be covered by one of those medicines, again, without kind of an eye on a prize of this is the disorder I'm treating and I'm just treating symptoms, then you can end up with, well, now I have this, doctor, this is happening. Okay, let's take this. Well, now this is happening. And then, okay, take that. And then you end up on all these meds. Now, okay, don't know if that's your situation. I'm just trying to address this in a general, from a general perspective, because this, this, this is not, this is typical, but I don't know about typical. This is not uncommon, okay? So now you're taking Effexor, Lamictal, Abilify, Propranolol, Hydroxyzine, Clon. Um, so, how, okay, getting back to your question though, how much is too much? I think it's too much when you've got too many medications in one category. Okay. Now, sometimes it's indicated to treat, to be on, say, two, um, two mood stabilizers. But in your case, let's say you're taking Effexor as one antidepressant. Okay, so you're on one antidepressant. Trazodone, you're probably taking for sleep. Um, you're taking three different mood stabilizers. Lamictal, Abilify, and Seroquel. My guess is because of that small amount of Seroquel, it's for sleep or maybe anxiety. So now you're talking two different things for sleep. 
maybe you switch those in and out. I, you know, I have some patients who we kind of have a long list because sleep stuff will wear off, the, the effect will wear off over time and you end up needing to take switch around, you know, musical pills. So take trazodone for a while, it's not working anymore, you stop that and take Seroquel. So if that's your case, then, you know, those two would kind of be looked at as one. If you're taking both at the same time, eh. Um, the clonopin, clonazepam 0.5, um, I'm guessing you're taking that for anxiety or maybe sleep. That little, sometimes people will, will take it just at night for sleep. So they'll, so let's just assume you've got this cocktail at night of clonopin, trazodone, and Seroquel. So even though those aren't all in the same category, there's still three different medicines for sleep versus one medicine for sleep that you take at a time. Be different if they're, again, you're kind of switching those in and out. But if you're taking three things for sleep, my opinion, that should be, that's too much. I think it, you know, it should be narrowed down to one or, or possibly two. Um, and, you know, if, if it, this is hypothetical, but if like, if I were treating you, for example, you came to me on this regimen, first thing I would do is see what you're taking, why you're taking these things. Like, what is this for? What is that for? What is that for? And then I would look to aim at, at kind of trimming down in a way that let's say if you, you know, if we're treating bipolar disorder, um, then, or, you know, I don't know, if we're treating bipolar disorder and anxiety, let's say that combination, um, I would look at trying to get you down to like no more than two mood stabilizers for your bipolar disorder. And then you might need something else that's separate for your anxiety. Propranolol, we talked about that being uh, typically what we'll use for anxiety, but then you've got hydroxazine, which is also for anxiety, but then you've got clonopin, which can also be anxiety. So again, look at anxiety issue and try and keep you at two, probably one, I mean, ideally one, but everybody can't get by with just one. So um, look at maybe no more than two for that condition. So I guess kind of a, a summary version of what I've been talk, rambling about is looking at the conditions that you're treating and trying to get to just no more than two per condition is a good approach now. You know, if I get under the hood here and look at what it is you're being treated for and all that, my answer could be different because there could be stuff I'm missing. Just, but just kind of bird's eye view of all of this. Um, yeah, my my initial response is I think, um, yeah, having more than two pills per condition is a bit much, um, and can lead to just more side effects and even more drug drug interactions every time a new doctor adds something, like let's say you've got high blood pressure, let's say it's nothing mental, you've got high blood pressure, now you've got to get put on a blood pressure medicine, that doctor should be, should know all your other medicines and put in, you know, an interaction, put them into an interaction checker to make sure that the medicine that they're adding doesn't negatively inter impact one of these meds. Like, Everybody, every doctor at this point going forward is going to need to do that every time they add something. I mean, they should be doing that anyway, even if you're only on two drugs, but um, it gets more complicated the longer the list goes. All right, I, I hope that helps, Tanya. Okay, I don't have my glasses on. I think this is Ollie. Excuse me, Ali, Iha, Iha, thank you for the question. I mean, thank you for the, the super chat. Um, I really appreciate it. So um, what indicate ADHD and psychosis are occurring? And if one is caused by dopamine deficiency and one is by excessive, how can they occur together? Okay, so... I'm thinking your question is what can cause ADHD and psychosis to co-occur? Um, and if one is caused by dopamine deficiency, the other 
Excess. Okay, so I'm glad you asked this question about dopamine. I know um, there's been, I mean, it's popular to talk about lacking dopamine. One thing to keep in mind is that um, dopamine production happens in different parts of the brain. There's different pathways to dopamine production. So those pathways determine the effect of the dopamine. So with ADHD, you've got um, a tract that goes from your, your brainstem up here. I'm like, I'm actually have pictures to show you. I wish I did. But anyway, up through um, to your frontal lobe or, or, or the, the prefrontal cortex and dopamine depletion or less dopamine there is what um, contributes to ADHD. I won't say causes because it's a, lot, it's a little more complicated than just there's less dopamine, you got ADHD. I mean, there's other factors, but let's just say one of the big contributors is less dopamine in the prefrontal cortex. The ex excess dopamine that causes that that's associated with schizophrenia is excess dopamine in a different portion of the brain. So it's not just kind of a global lower dopamine level and this stuff happens or increase it and this stuff happens. It just depends on where, what tract it's called um, or pathway is being affected. So when you take, when someone takes, um, uh, antipsychotic medications. The idea is to reduce dopamine in the areas where uh, it's it, where um, it affects um, schizophrenia or causes schizophrenia and the, the psychotic symptoms. However, reducing the dopamine in those areas helps the schizophrenia or helps the psychosis, but that low level of dopamine in other parts of the brain that affect your muscular movement is what's responsible for the um, Parkinsonian effects that we can see with the antipsychotics where people can move slowly or um, have kind of the a stone faces with very little facial expression or even um, start to have like the tardive dyskinesia with the with the slow movements or um, even muscle stiffness. So all that to say, um, you can have co-occurring ADHD and psychosis because dopamine does different things in different parts of the brain. Um, it is not that uncommon for someone with a psychotic illness to also have ADHD. Um, psychosis is a general term, so it can occur as a primary disorder in something like schizophrenia or delusional disorder, but it can occur as a, it's a, an additional, not an additional, as a symptom of a bigger problem in something like depression. You can have a psychotic depression, which is an indicator of the severity of the depression. So people who are severely depressed can become psychotic. It's like being hot, hot, hot depressed psychosis. Same thing with mania. It, you can have, psychosis with mania, but psychosis isn't your primary illness. It's just a symptom. You can get psychosis with, um, with drug addiction, certain drugs, certain medications. Someone could um, get a high dose of steroids and have uh, psychotic symptoms. So, um, so yes, again, summary. I always have to give summary because I know I go on. Summary is you can have psychosis. Um, sorry, you can dopamine acts in different acts differently in different parts of the brain. You could have low levels in your prefrontal cortex that contribute to ADHD. You can have low levels in parts of your midbrain and things that contribute to uh, Parkin Parkinson's disease or Parkinson symptoms if you're taking a medicine that does that. You can have elevated levels of dopamine in other parts of your brain that cause psychotic symptoms. All right, thanks for that question. Okay, 
Cheapy. 78. Sorry if I mispronounced that. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for the, um, the super chat. I have stopped taking my bipolar meds after finishing a month-long ketamine treatment program. I also feel no need to take lithium again. What's going on? What questions should I ask my med provider concerning alternatives to lithium? Thank you. Well, first of all, congratulations. <laughs> That's wonderful that ketamine did that for you um, as far as uh, helping you be symptom free to the extent that you don't need to take your medications. I think um, I have had a couple now of people with bipolar disorder patients who got ketamine at first um, before ketamine has become more and more popular. Um, I think some centers anyway we're only doing it for unipolar depression because the jury was still out on to how beneficial it would be for bipolar depression and whether or not it would trigger mania so i'm seeing now that a trend um with even with people with bipolar um depression being able to get ketamine and it being beneficial not being able to get it but i mean yeah being able to get it but also that it's beneficial and not triggering mania and making their bipolar disorder worse. Okay, so now where do you go from here is kind of what this question is about, which is you should see this as if you have bipolar disorder, as I mentioned earlier in the stream, bipolar disorder, as is depression, is a recurring illness. It is not, I mean, I'm sorry to say that, but it is not something that you can get this blitz of some kind of treatment and it's gone forever. Now, how long it will take for symptoms to come back is variable from person to person. So it could be months, it could be years. Uh, the inter-episode period is variable from person to person. So you still, if you're not on anything, you need to be very vigilant with looking for symptoms, that means having a good understanding of what your prodrome symptoms are. If you want to understand more about that, um, I have a, a video talking about that in my, on my bipolar playlist. I also have a uh, bipolar guide um, that is digital. Um, the print version is on Amazon, um, where I kind of talk in more detail about that, but it becomes about being educated about what your early symptoms look like so you can see an episode coming, okay? So that you can get treatment really quickly. Now, whether that treatment ends up being ketamine for you, if you wanna to return to that, or, um, or just regular standard medications, then that would be the time to like do something before the episode gets out of control. Um, so, but probably a better approach given that um this is this is not an illness that or disorder that goes away it's just now you don't have symptoms and you're in remission um a better approach would be to get on something maintenance to to stay in remission to keep you out of an episode you said you don't want to take lithium again okay there's a lot of other medicines out there. Um, I don't think that it should be a big ask or a big statement to say to your provider, you don't wanna take lithium. Lithium, lithium's a great drug, okay? No question, but it's not for everyone. Um, also in that bipolar playlist, I, talk, I have a video talking about who, who is best for lithium, but in a nutshell, it's people with more classic symptoms, um, we're happy mania, um, clean separation between episodes. So you don't have um, like this chronic level of low level depression in between episodes. Um, and also people who tend to have had more manic symptoms seem to respond a little better to, um, to lithium. Um, so at any rate, uh it's not it should not be a big ask or ask to say um i don't want to take lithium what else can i take to keep me in remission 
Now, the other options, though, uh, probably the one with the least side effects would be lamotrigine. It is an anticonvulsant. We use it as a mood stabilizer. Um, psychiatrists use it as a mood stabilizer. Um, it is. It kind of has a subtle effect, I think, in the sense that you. it's not like you take it and go, oh, yeah, I'm so much better. It's more like you take it. And I've had some patients be like, after a while, like, I don't know what this is doing for me. Can I get off this? We get off of it. They have a dip and they're like, oh, okay, now, now I see. All right, I'll get back on the Lamotrigine. So it kind of has this more in the background effect, but still um, some people can be maintained on Lamotrigine as the only agent that they take. We call that monotherapy um, and, and be fine and it keeps symptoms at bay. Now, what, what could end up happening is you, you get on something like Lamotrigine, it, it, there's a buildup process. It takes about six weeks to get up to a therapeutic dose, by the way. You get on it, and like now, while you have no symptoms, it would be kind of be a good time to like on board with lithium, I mean, sorry, Lamotrigine. And then, um, and what could happen is you could still have some breakthrough symptoms because not everyone can handle monotherapy. Some people need two agents or even three agents to manage their bipolar disorder. Some people need, um, can kind of go on off stuff. So you, you take this one medicine like Lamotrigine as your baseline medicine, you have uh, a dip, uh, like so you have some breakthrough depression symptoms and then maybe your doctor then adds on something or you have breakthrough mania or hypomania even though you're on the Lamotrigine and your doctor adds maybe another mood stabilizer to bring you down. And then once that once that passes, those symptoms pass and you're kind of back, then they could take off that thing that they added so that you're back on the Lamotrigine. Or you could just stay on it because you, you just feel more comfortable with that. I would say Lamotrigine is probably the easiest thing to get on and stay on as a way to control and keep your symptoms from coming back, or if they do come back, only come back mildly. Other options would be things like um, the antipsychotic medications that we use as mood stabilizers, like Latuda, um, Abilify, uh, Quetiapine, Seroquel, great, but a lot of weight gain. So all of these meds that I just mentioned, the antipsychotics have a lot of side effects. So um, they're, they're, you know, they work very well, but uh, they, you get more into side effects with those medications. And then there's, and then last uh, point about this, there are other, anti, uh, not antipsychotic, anti-convulsant mood stabilizers, Depakote, um, Tegretol, both of those uh, have been used for years to treat bipolar disorder. I tend not to talk about them a whole lot or mention them much because um, they're good, but uh, you do have to get blood work. You've got to make sure you kind of like the lithium. So if you're fine, like going and getting your blood checked and all that, um, then that should not be a big deal. But I guess I just kind of work with a lot of people who don't want to be bothered with that. So for Lamotrigine, because you don't need blood work for that. But um, the, the Depakote, valproic acid is the generic name. You need to um, get regular blood work to check for like not only the level, because there's a there's a window, therapeutic window, just like with lithium, um, but uh, other side effects like low platelets. Um, I've seen some hair loss with uh, with uh, Depakote. Uh, that that was minor, though. I mean, not minor. That hair loss is not minor, but that was a minority, a very small minority of people who had that problem. Um, Tegretol, uh, I tend not to use that much after I got out of residency because it has more drug-drug interactions. So just like a previous question, we were looking at that long list of meds and I was saying, you know, every person who prescribes you a new medicine has got to go through that list with you. Tegretol tends to not play well with some medications. So it's more drug-drug interactions such that you know if you got on it and it did well for you then you kind of might be eliminated from taking other stuff in the future because it interferes with your tegretol or um tegretol can also cause um low red blood cells which is 
pretty serious situation. So you got to, you know, get blood checks with that too. So that's, that's that. All right, Rushman. Just wanted to give a big thanks. You've been incredibly helpful to not just myself, but especially in helping my friends and family get a better understanding of my bipolar one. Truly thankful. Perfect. Thank you. This is, a, I mean, what you've just articulated is exactly why I do this. I want people to be able to better understand themselves, but also I want other people to better, other people involved in your life to help to be better able to understand. And then more globally reduce um, the, the stigma and all of that of mental health by by having it not be such a black box. People are afraid of stuff they don't understand. So the more people who can understand, then the less fear, judgment, and all of that. And that's why I do this. So you are welcome. I'm glad what I set out to do has worked. Miss Naya, I love that you do this. Thank you. You are welcome. You are welcome. Daryl, because of your sugar video, my A1C is now 5.9. Knocking on the door. Is that because your door's wood? <laughs> Great. Excellent. Good. I'm, I'm glad. I wish I could be a little bit more disciplined. I go back and forth with sugar. I go off of it and then like rebound. But anyway, good, great for you. All right, Tracy, we've got the same name. Where did you get your eyeglass frames? Where did I get my eyeglass frames? First of all, these are old. I got them from Lens Crafters. Uh, they're a couple of years, a uh, couple of years old. Yes, they're red. Let me see. Are I can now I can't see without them. I think I want to say they're Donna Karen. No, they're Coach. Their coach. Um, I had some that had like the plastic, like nose thing, and that hurt. Like I'd take them off and I'd have these dents. Like that's not gonna work. So anyway, so these are nice and comfortable. They slide on and off easily. Since they're readers, I can't see with them. You know, I don't want to be doing this. So anyway, um, so yeah. Long answer, coach from Lens Crafters. <laughs> Thanks for that. Okay, Heavenly Presley, thank you for the super chat. I have bipolar 2 and CPTSD from abuse, SA, DV, not sure what that means, okay. Biggest issue for me is paranoia, that I can't control things or something will happen to me. And I guess that gives you panic is what you're saying or that you'll get panic. So, okay, let me break, let me go back. So you've got bipolar 2 and CPTSD, which CPSD, for those who don't know, is uh, um, chronic, um, chronic PTSD, which um, really is not an official diagnosis. PTSD is an official diagnosis. The chronic nature of it is, um, kind of is more of a psychological concept or construct of people who develop a trauma response in response to um, as a result of long term consistent or repeated trauma. The difference, the significant difference, though, is PTSD itself has a very a certain look to it. Flashbacks, lots of vigilance, avoidance, blah, blah, blah. CPTSD because the idea is that the trauma affects you early in life during your formative years, formative years of your personality and things, that it affects, it affects your personality, it kind of like gets weaved into um, how you see the world and, and how you respond to the world and basically your personality. So that's different. That's a different look. Someone with CPTSD has a different look and effect than someone who is say a full grown adult and then they get into a car accident and now they have PTSD around that single traumatic event. Okay, so I just wanna explain that. So now back to the question. Yeah, bipolar disorder, bipolar two, CPTSD. Um, 
and I'm not sure about the SADD, but I probably don't need to know all that. Um, biggest issue is paranoia that I can't control things or something will happen to me. So my thought about that, Heavenly Presley, I hope you're in therapy. Uh, I know that therapy is easy for me to just say that, but therapy isn't always that accessible to people. Um, but because the reason I say that is because your bipolar disorder, think of it, I know I've used this analogy a bunch of times, think of it as like a storm going through and your CPTSD is more like the climate, like it's there and it's there. But, you know, if a storm passes through, um, the climate affects how that storm is expressed. So if you're in a super cold climate, the storm, you might have snowstorms and stuff. I'm from Florida. Our storms are mostly hurricanes and rain and stuff like that. Very little snow. So, so your bipolar disorder is not going is not necessarily going to be responsible, so to speak, for your paranoia. It could if you were manic and then, you know, had psychosis attached to that mania or the or depression even and had a psychotic episode. But if you're talking about kind of general everyday paranoia, that probably has more to do with your CPTSD. And um, that is going to take, I think it's going to take a, a professional helping you dig out from under that to see um, how you can overcome the paranoid thoughts, overcome in the sense of have that not be your knee jerk response to things. Because let's say, I'm just trying to think of a quick scenario. Um, let's say um, part of the abuse was a caretaker doesn't have to be always a parent. I feel like I'm always blaming parents, but um, a caretaker, uh, older sibling, or even um, you know uh, people you were exposed to, you know, at a young age, who you were consistently exposed to, who um, made you always made you feel unsafe because they're all they're worried about stuff. So they they put that on, they project that onto you. You can't do this. Very um maybe even very protective and not even letting you do stuff because the world's an unsafe place so this is what they pass on to you that's not necessarily abuse okay that's more of a just you know kind of family dynamic thing but um and you know maybe they uh maybe where the abuse could come in in, in this example is putting you down all the time when you try and kind of step out on the limb and you know, and, and be brave and try something. And they're like, what are you doing? You, know, you why are you even doing that? You, um, you know, stupid, you shouldn't be doing that kind of stuff. This is, you know, you're not good at this and that, and I don't know why you tried to do blah, 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 you know, whatever, very disparaging comments, discouraging you. And it might be because that person isn't brave enough to do that stuff. They see you doing it. So they're going to hold you back. Okay. Well, don't get me started anyway. So, if you kind of grow up with that um, sense of what if this, if I can't, I can't do this because people will do this, or I can't do that because people do this. I don't know if that's what you mean by paranoia, but this kind of fear of persecution in some way. Why do you fear that persecution? Because it was taught to you to fear persecution. You were persecuted because you'd be criticized or torn down um, or maybe even punished for doing stuff that you were just exploring or you were just trying to express yourself and you get torn down with criticism or go to your room or you know whatever that looks like. You can then step through life fearing, fearing lots of stuff, just kind of having this free floating fear all the time which one could argue is you know paranoid thinking in a way not kind of what we think of as psychotic paranoia but uh fear of persecution so 
a professional could help you see that pattern, even if you recognize that pattern. This is because of this. How do you then break through that and, and process that and be able to see things differently as an adult now who's got more control over things? And some people will call this reparenting. Um, you know, there's not just kind of one thing to do. I do think it would take someone helping you see the, the particular vulnerable areas that trigger this paranoia or that make you feel uncomfortable. It may be limited to certain, certain types of things you do, like you, um, relationships you know you you have trouble staying in relationships or feeling comfortable in relationships because you're constantly fearful that the other person's going to leave or that they're going to they don't hold you in very high regard and this doesn't have to necessarily be a romantic relationship it could be friendships colleagues even like you just are constantly believing that people don't have your best interest in mind and are there to harm you in some way and at some level, you recognize where this is coming from. You might not, but you, you might, but still just can't make yourself not think that. Um, like the, the, the first steps would be recognize these, recognizing these vulnerable areas. Like what, what, what's the pattern here? What's the circumstance that makes you think this? You can start by kind of writing these out, journaling. What a circum when you start to feel paranoid, what's the circumstance? Write that out. Um, was it something someone said? Something someone did? Was it something you were expected to do? And then also write out, what is your fear? What do you think is going to happen? Once you kind of get, and then, and then just kind of go day to day and, and keep coming up with these scenarios to, so that you can get someone, you and someone can get a bird's eye view of what's going on here. Are there patterns? Are there things that really trip this up for you? Or is this, it's probably not just this general every day, doesn't matter what the circumstance, this is how it is. I doubt, well, it might be, but I doubt that that's, I, I bet you, if you really kind of dig in you can see that there are certain scenarios and you might be in those scenarios a lot, but it's certain things that really stir this up for you. And how can you minimize <laughs> your exposure to those things? But then also how can you reaffirm yourself in a way that you are not responding to these scenarios like a child um, and, 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 in responding to it as the adult that you are and um, with more control than you believe you really have. That's kind of a generic answer, but I think um, that's a good place to start with kind of, in, with getting kind of an understanding of where this gets, uh, how this gets activated and then getting probably um, a therapist. If you don't already have one, you might already have one um, to help you with that. Uh, she, she says, yes, constantly put down my whole life, abandoned by my parents, sexual assault. Yeah. So, uh, gosh, I'm sorry. So yeah, that's a lot. That's a lot to unpack and, but you can, you can do it. And I, I do think, I will say this, I do think a measured approach is, is as far as what you should expect the outcome to be. My opinion is, and granted, I don't do trauma therapy enough, or I don't do trauma therapy to be able to say, yeah, of the thousand people I've treated, this is what happens. But I think kind of realistically, I mean, I've treated people with trauma. I just haven't been the trauma therapist. I think a desired outcome a reasonable outcome is get to where you're able to think about these past incidences, still feel some amount of pain, disappointment, loss, things like that, but it's more on an intellectual level, similar to how I would think about this if you told me. Like if you 
I mean, just even me reading that, I'm like, gosh, that's awful. But I'm not destroyed by it. Like, I'll still be able to get up and, you know, work today because it didn't happen to me. So an, a desired outcome for you as the person who endured this, instead of being shrouded by all of the, these negative thoughts about it and having, you know, kind of drowning in all the things you missed out on, um, all the things like hearing what people are saying, like having this repeat in your head, the things that people are saying, or even re-experiencing the assault and feeling the shame from that, all that, instead of all of that going on, you're better able to recall them with less of that uh, intense emotions around it. And it's more like an, it's more like just a recollection with a little bit of negative thought attached to it. That's, I think, kind of the ideal scenario because you, you're not, you're not an automaton. You're not going to be able to just have no emotions or experiences. That's not even realistic. We're, we're emotional beings. The goal is just to not have the raw emotions that kind of haven't really left, not be so raw, be healed over enough to where you can acknowledge them and maybe even feel them a little bit, but they don't dominate your thinking and they don't keep you feel keep they don't keep feeding into how you see your current self because that's the other part of this especially with the C cptsd aspect is it weaving all of that negativity weaving itself into the fabric of who you are you've got to like pull out those bad threads and reconnect as someone you feel good about who's still flawed. So you're not, you're not looking to like not have anything be wrong with you, but you can still like affirm yourself without needing and validate yourself without needing other people to do that for you. Um, because when you're super vulnerable and super broken, you need everything to kind of reaffirm you and you, you want to be able to have that come from within. All right. I know it sounds kind of fluffy, but all right so this is it evan i love your videos they are so helpful thank you evan thank you um and nori says i am so grateful for your help here online you are welcome you are also very welcome thanks for coming i enjoyed this uh don't forget about my my email uh, list getmentalhealthtips.com is a way you can stay connected to me um and for my weekly newsletter mostly weekly and um i'm not i don't have a plan for doing this next month i've got some other things going on next month but uh i do want to come back and uh do some more lives at some point but in the meantime i have the other videos coming my regular i'm still producing videos Alrighty, take care bye bye